I have returned to the God of my childhood, to the same simple faith as a child I once knew, like the prodigal son. I longed for my loved ones, for the comforts of home. And the God I outgrew. I have returned to the God of my childhood, Bethlehem's faith, the prophet's Messiah. Well, we finished our last study with a question. Is Jesus eternal God? I want you to remember again that text, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What type of sacrifice did God give when Jesus came into this world? How valuable was that sacrifice? To begin with, let's think about who Jesus was to begin with. You remember the story when the wise men came from the east. They came to Jerusalem in search of the Messiah. They had followed his star all the way there. And when they came among the people, they were surprised that no, there was no commotion or anything like that in Jerusalem. So they began to inquire, Matthew 2 verses 1 through 4. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. First of all, they came to Jerusalem in order to worship the king. So they had to find a way. Where is this king? So when they asked Herod, Herod asked the scribes to do some research. And what was the result? Verses 5 and 6. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this it is written of the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So here, the priests began researching and they came up with a text. He is to be born in Bethlehem. Now, what text did they actually find? They were reading Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. I want to read the original in the book of Micah because it gives a little bit more information about this being. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth hath been from of old, from everlasting. The term goings forth. Now keep in mind, this is speaking about Jesus. By comparing Matthew and Micah, we see clearly this is in reference to the Jesus Christ. Now, it says here, his goings forth. What does this mean, his goings forth? Well, in the original Hebrew, it means either family descent, the term that is translated goings forth, either means family descent or a sewer. Now we know it's not talking about a sewer. We're talking about Jesus. Therefore, we are talking about origin, his family origin. Where is this origin of Jesus? According to this verse, how long before Jesus was born in a manger did he have his existence? It says here, from everlasting. The marginal reading says, his goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. 
Jesus existed from eternity. Therefore, Jesus is eternity. The Desire of Ages, 469 to 470. He had announced himself to be the self-existent one. He who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth had been from of old, from the days of eternity. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 228. From all eternity, Christ was united with the Father. And when he took upon himself human nature, he was still one with God. He is the link that unites God with humanity. How long was Christ united with the Father? It says here, from all eternity. For this reason, when we talk about Jesus Christ, in prophecy, Isaiah, in chapter 9, verse 6, states, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who is Jesus? According to this text, He is the mighty God. Jesus is the everlasting Father. So before Jesus was born in a manger, He existed from eternity. In Evangelism, page 615. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. What do you understand by the term self-existent? Self-existent doesn't mean he came from somewhere. Self-existent means he exists of himself. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. There never was a time when he wasn't associated with him. He whose voice the Jews were then listening had been with God as one brought up with him. As one what? Brought up with him. It means that they grew up together. I do not grow up with my father or my grandfather. I may grow up with my brother, but not with my father. So now, Selected Messages, Book 1, 247. The world was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If Christ made all things, he existed before all things. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity, God overall blessed forevermore. When we speak about Jesus Christ, we are speaking about God in the highest sense. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity. A distinct person, yet one with the Father. Jesus' existence is eternal. He is the eternal being. For this reason, because He is eternal, when Jesus came to this world, he seemed quite different. The angels looked at that babe in Bethlehem, the one who they were accustomed to worshiping. And now, can angels worship this being now in a manger? What did God have to do? Hebrews 1 verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What did God have to announce? The Father says to Jesus, Thy throne, O God. That's what he says to the Son. Thy throne, O God. If the Father is to call Jesus God. What are we to refer to him as? Is Jesus God? Is he eternal God? Well, the Father said so. And if the Father said so, then I 
sure must say so. A.T. Jones, in the book Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, page 13, he tells us that in the German translation, instead of saying, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, it says, Thy throne, O God, is from eternity to eternity. Jesus is from eternity to eternity. I want to next turn your attention to the experience of Moses in Exodus chapter 13. You remember the time Moses was there on Mount Horeb? He had just been taking care of those sheep for 40 years. He sees a burning bush. And from that burning bush, he ends up having a discussion with God. Exodus 3 verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am had sent me unto you. So Moses was questioning when the children of Israel asked, Who sent you here? What am I to say? And God says, say to them, I am had sent you. The word I am means to exist. Later on, this I am referred to himself by a different name. In Exodus 6 verse 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. They did not understand him as Jehovah. And the term Jehovah means self-existent one. The I am is the self-existent one. In Manuscript Releases, volume 14, page 21. I am means an eternal presence. The past, the present, and future are alike to God. He sees the most remote events of past history and the far distant future with as clear a vision as we do those things that are transpiring daily. God knows the future. God knows the past. Jehovah means that eternal presence. In John chapter 8, verses 56 to 58, we find Jesus in a very heated discussion with the Pharisees. And in the conclusion of his discussion, Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? You're still a young man. How can you tell me that you have seen Abraham? And listen carefully to Jesus' response in verse 58. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was I am. Although the term I am is used throughout the New Testament, this word does not necessarily mean deity. But when we read the context of the passage, we can understand that when Jesus said, before Abraham was I am, he was referring to the I am that spoke from the burning bush. Let's evaluate the context of this passage. We start in verse 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my father, and you do that which ye have seen of your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto him, If ye were children of Abraham, ye would do the works of Abraham. Jesus goes on then to show them that they are of their father, the devil, in verses 40 and then verse 44. Since they were talking about their origins, they say they are from Abraham. And who are you, Jesus? Jesus answers their question in verse 42. If God were your father, 
ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now here Jesus is talking about his coming to this earth. He's not talking here about his pre-existence. He is talking about him while he was here. I proceeded forth and came from God. How do we know that? The previous verse, verse 41. He says, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They threw a slant at Jesus. They were talking about his virgin birth. And they say, well, you were born of fornication. That's what they were really saying. And we are Abraham's seed. In Desire of Ages 467, Jesus denied that the Jews were children of Abraham. He said, ye do the deeds of your father. In mockery they answered, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. These words were in allusion to the circumstances of his birth, were intended to as a thrust against Christ in the presence of those who are beginning to believe in him. Jesus gave no heed to the base insinuation, but said, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. So Jesus explains about his birth in Bethlehem. Now, later on in that same discussion, Jesus says, Before Abraham was I am. This is, again, the context of origins. Now, how do we know that the Jews, when Jesus said, before Abraham was I am, how do we know that the Jews understood Jesus as claiming to be the I am of the time of Moses? In verse 59, what did they do? As soon as Jesus says, before Abraham was I am, then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. So what did they want to do? They wanted to stone him. Why did they want to stone Jesus? John 10, verse 30 to 33. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Well, they keep taking up stones, it seems like. John chapter 8, they took up stones. John 10, they take up stones. Why? Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. What was the issue here? The issue is that Jesus, you are making yourself to be God. You have taken the idea of the I am of the Old Testament, the self-existent one, and you have claimed it for yourself. Is that really what the meaning is? Let's read a few statements. Manuscript releases, volume 14, page 22. 1,500 years before Christ laid off his royal robes, his kingly crown, and left his position of honor in the heavenly courts, assumed humanity, and walked a man among the children of men, Abraham saw his day and was glad. Back then, Abraham saw it. In Desire of Ages 469, with solemn dignity, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. Why? Why did silence fall upon them? Notice what it says. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. He announced himself to be the self-existent one. In other words, Jesus claimed the title of self-existent one. He claimed that he is the I am of the Old Testament. Again, manuscript releases volume 14. The Pharisees were horrified at this declaration of Christ before Abraham was I am. They were beside themselves with rage that he should express such awful blasphemy, claiming to be the I am. They would have stoned him then and there. But Jesus disappeared and blinded their eyes. So we find here that Jesus is deity. Let's take a look at some other statements 
from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. We find here that Jehovah is the one that created Israel. This same Jehovah is the one that gave them water in the wilderness. Isaiah 43, verse 20. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This Jehovah who gave water in the wilderness is called a rock. Isaiah 44, verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? And I notice this. Yea, there is no God. And if you look at the margin, rock. There is no rock. I know not any. So here, Jehovah is the rock in the wilderness. Jehovah is the one that gave them water from that rock. And who was that rock? 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the wilderness and in the sea, and all did eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Yes, that rock is Jesus Christ. This same Jehovah is called the Savior of Israel. Isaiah 43, verse 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. He says he is thy Savior. In Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11, he tells us how many saviors there are. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. We read that earlier at the very beginning. There is no God besides Jehovah. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, or Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. How many saviors do we have? There is none besides Jehovah. Matthew 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jehovah and Isaiah says, There is no Savior besides me, and Jesus means Savior, for he shall save his people from their sins. Acts 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Therefore, the Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Furthermore, in Isaiah 48, verse 12 and 13, Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. My hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Here he speaks about the first and the last. Now, who is the first and the last? Revelation 1, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. We find out that the first and the last is the Alpha and Omega. He is the Almighty. Who is this Almighty? Who is this Alpha and Omega? Who is this first and the last? Revelation 22, verse 12 and 13, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is none other than Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. For that reason, when Jesus came into this world, in Matthew 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Yes, Jesus is God. Jesus is deity. Now, I want to go a little bit more into this other aspect. 
because he is deity, what does he possess? John 1 verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He has life in himself, John 5 verse 26. For as the Father had life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. This life and desire of ages, 530, in Christ is life, original, unbowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. So he did not borrow it. He did not get it from anywhere else. It was his originally. When Lucifer attacked Christ in heaven and accused him of taking the wrong role, the Father had to explain why Jesus was different. I'd like to read a passage that describes this experience about Lucifer in heaven. In Patriarchs and Prophets, I want to start here on page 36. The angels joyfully acknowledged the supremacy of Christ and prostrating themselves before him poured out their love and adoration. Lucifer bowed with them, but in his heart there was a strange, fierce conflict. Truth, justice, and loyalty are struggling against envy and jealousy. The influence of the holy angels seemed for a time to carry him with them. As songs of praise ascended in melodious strains, swelled by thousands of glad voices, the spirit of evil seemed vanquished. Unutterable love thrilled his entire being. His soul went out in harmony with the sinless worshipers, in love to the Father and the Son. But again he was filled with pride in his own glory. He desired for supremacy, returned, and envy of Christ was once again indulged. The high honors conferred upon Lucifer were not appreciated as God's special gift and therefore called forth no gratitude to his creator. He gloried in his brightness and exaltation and aspired to be equal with God. What was his desire? He had the desire to be equal with God. He was beloved and reverenced by the heavenly host. Angels delighted to execute his commands and he was clothed with wisdom and glory above them all. Yet the Son of God was exalted above him as one in power and authority with the Father. This is what bothered him, that Jesus was exalted above him as one in power and authority with the Father. He shared the Father's counsels while Lucifer did not thus enter into the purposes of God. Why, question this mighty angel, should Christ have the supremacy? Why is he honored above Lucifer? Going down a bit further on page 37, the exaltation of the Son of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who it was claimed was also entitled to reverence and honor. The fact that Jesus was exalted above him was giving him the troubled thoughts. Did the Father exalt Jesus above Lucifer? Let me read on page 38. There had been no change in the position or authority of Christ. There was no change. Lucifer's envy and misrepresentation and his claims to equality with Christ had made necessary a statement of the true position of the Son of God. But this had been the same from the beginning. What had been the same from the beginning? Jesus was not lifted up above Lucifer. Jesus was always that way. It just seemed that way. And that's why the Father had to clarify the position of Jesus Christ. But there was no change in the character of Christ. This battle over who is Jesus and his right to deity is where sin began. Sin originated with the issue between Lucifer and Christ. The fact that Christ was equal to God. Lucifer thought that he could be elevated to that position. You cannot be made deity. That is impossible. Christ was God. His life was original, unborrowed, 
underived. For that reason, Jesus was able to say in John 10, 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. So Jesus was authorized to tell people in this world about his eternal life that he has in himself. This mystery of Jesus Christ being God and becoming man will never be fully understood on this side of eternity. Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 11, 13. This is a great mystery, a mystery that will not be fully, completely understood in all its greatness until the translation of the redeemed shall take place. We will be able to understand it one day, but right now we can believe it because it is written. Let's evaluate a little bit more about who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who is this Word? In verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This word is none other than Jesus Christ. Now, who is Jesus Christ in relationship to our creation? John 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So Jesus Christ is the creator of the world. In Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 11, 26. If Christ made all things, he existed before all things. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity God overall blessed forevermore. There is no question as to the deity of Jesus Christ. Again, Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1126. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity a distinct person, yet one with the Father. A little bit further down the page. Now of the human, he was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He voluntarily assumed human nature. It was his own act and by his own consent. It was his own action. He clothed his divinity with humanity. He was all the while as God, but he did not appear as God. So the problem people have about his deity is that he does not appear as God. He veiled his divinity with his humanity, but nonetheless he came to this world. It was his own consent. It was by his own choice. He veiled the demonstrations of deity, which had commanded the homage and called forth the admiration of the universe of God. He was God while upon earth, but he divested himself of the form of God. So the outward form was human, but he was still God. Down further, he was God, but the glories of the form of God, he for a while relinquished. He relinquished it for a little while, the form of God, the outward glories of divinity. On 11.28, Christ could not have come to this earth with the glory that he had in the heavenly courts. Sinful human beings could not have borne the sight. He veiled his divinity with the garb of humanity, but he did not part with his divinity. He did not separate from his divinity. A divine human savior, he came to stand at the head of the fallen race to share in their experience from childhood to manhood. Again, on page 1129. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, 
yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine, nor the divine the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparably one, and yet they had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. When we are studying the nature of Christ, understanding who he is, we cannot separate the fact that Jesus is a part of the Godhead. Down further. There is no one who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. So the fact that people tell me, well, we cannot understand it. You cannot explain his divinity and humanity combined. It is true. I cannot explain it. I don't need to explain it. All I have to do is read it and believe it, and that's where the source of overcoming is found. Yet we know that he came to this earth and lived as a man among men. The man Christ Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty, yet Christ and the Father are one. The deity did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary, yet it is nonetheless true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In him, we go, read on, in him was life, and the life was the life of men. It is not physical life that is here specified, but eternal life, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The Word who was with God and who was God had this life. Physical life is something which each individual received. It is not eternal nor immortal, for God the life giver takes it away. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this life from him. Further down, divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined and man and God became one. It is in this union that we find the hope of the fallen race. To try to make Jesus less than eternal God takes away from the plan of redemption. If Satan could only lower the estimation of who Jesus is, he would have accomplished what he tried to start out there in heaven. He's trying to make Jesus to his level. But Jesus is God. And in combining that eternal deity with sinful human mankind's nature, the combination of these two is our hope. Divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined, and man and God became one. It is in this union that we find the hope of the fallen race. That is where we find our hope. In Colossians 1, 13 through 17, we find that Jesus created all things. It says, Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus is before all things. By Jesus Christ, all things consist. He created everything. Now, sometimes we get tied down with terminology. It says here that he is the firstborn of every creature. Now, to be able to understand this firstborn of every creature, we need to understand how does God use the term firstborn in the Bible. If we can see how God uses the term firstborn in the Bible, then we can understand it in that context. To try to say that he was born first contradicts all the statements that we have read already. In the Bible, the term firstborn is used for other reasons than being born first. For example, Psalm 89, verse 20, and then 27. Verse 20, I have found David my servant with my holy oil, have I anointed him. Verse 27, also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of this earth. David was not the first king, and David was not the firstborn in his family. In 1 Samuel 6, verse 11, we find that he was the youngest 
of the children of Jesse. So the firstborn does not always mean born first. In Exodus 4, verse 22, we read, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So God was speaking about Israel as his firstborn. But again, Israel or Jacob was not the firstborn. Genesis 25, 24 to 26. At least he was not born first. Ephraim also is called the firstborn in Jeremiah 31, verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Ephraim was not the firstborn of the children of Israel. That was Reuben. Ephraim was not the firstborn of Israel. Joseph either. Let's take a look in Genesis 41, verse 51 and 52. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Joseph had two sons. The oldest was Manasseh. The youngest was Ephraim. So Joseph was not the firstborn. That was Reuben. He was the firstborn of Rachel, but not the firstborn of Israel. But of his sons, Manasseh was the firstborn. From this we can see that the word firstborn does not always mean born first. The word firstborn here actually means preeminence, the position that the firstborn brings about. So Jesus, when it says he is the firstborn of every creature, does not mean that he is the one that was born first. Because we see from the other statements that we have just read that Jesus is the eternal self-existent Son of God. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, this term begotten, only begotten, what does it mean, only begotten? Well, we may think He is the only born Son of God. And so, we think that He was born first and then Others came afterwards. Well, if it says only begotten, it means there were no other afterwards. But what does only begotten mean? I look through the New Testament, the word begotten, the same word that is used in John 3, 16. And usually it refers to Jesus Christ. Only one other passage does it use for someone else that gives me the idea of what it means. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, when Abraham took Isaac on that altar there on Mount Moriah, and he lifted up that knife to slay his son, it says here that he was about to slay his only begotten son. Question. Was Isaac Abraham's only begotten son? You read in Genesis that at least by the time of Hebrews being written, they would know about the fact that after Sarah died, Abraham got married with Keturah and had several other sons with her. So Isaac was not the only begotten son. Matter of fact, Isaac was not Abraham's first son. He was the first son of Sarah, but not of Abraham. And here it says that Abraham offered up his only begotten son. We know that Abraham had a son, Ishmael, through Hagar, before Isaac was born. So what does this mean? This cannot mean only begotten in the sense only born, because then it wouldn't be telling us the truth. But Isaac was the only promised son. He was the only son that came by intervention of God, by a miracle. You may remember when Isaac was born, his mother Sarah was not supposed to have any more children. She was well beyond childbearing years. And through a miracle, a son was born. When we are talking about Jesus 
as the only begotten Son. We have to be talking about his birth as a miracle. And the only birth of Jesus as a miracle that we can be talking about is the virgin birth. So when it says that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, it's because he's the only one that came in this way. He was born of the Holy Ghost in Mary's womb. Because Jesus is God, Jesus can be worshipped. We read already in Matthew 2 that the wise men came from the east for what purpose? It says here in verse 11, it shows what they did. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They came to worship Jesus. Can you worship something other than deity without violating the law of God? It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, nor worship them. You see, there is to be no worship of anything other than deity. Jesus has to be complete deity in order to be worshipped. For that reason, Jesus is God. We read in Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, that he is the express image of his person. In a sketch of the Christian experience and views of Ellen G. White, page 43 to 44, here's what it reads. I saw a throne and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if the Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it, for said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. So here, Jesus is the express image of the Father. He is above the angels. Hebrews 1 verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Again, this is speaking of Jesus' incarnation. In Hebrews 1 verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So there was a day when the father looked at Jesus and said, This day have I begotten thee. And it is at that time that he commanded all the angels to worship him. Let's just read that context. Hebrews chapter 1, we begin at verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. You see, when he was brought into this world, when he became incarnate, that is when the angels had to be commanded to worship him because they didn't see him as they saw him before. The Father contrasts Jesus with the angels again in verse 7 and 8. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels, spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Or as we read earlier, from eternity to eternity. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. As we look at deity, let's remember those verses in Isaiah 43, verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall they be after me. In order for Jesus in any way to be called God, he has to coexist. He could never come into being after the Father. They have to coexist. From these verses that we've read so far, we can see very clearly 
that Jesus is eternal God. And as eternal God, Jesus came into this world. He gave up that lofty position. In our next study, we want to learn a little bit about the prophecies regarding Jesus' humiliation from being the creator of the world to that babe in Bethlehem and on to Calvary. I have returned to the bed of my mother. I learned that Most godlike man a child could know. I just heard a shout from the angels in glory, praising the Lord. A child has come home.